Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Joe Papano from Fiberlink Communications. Uh, thanks for joining us again today uh, at uh, our biweekly more webinar. Um, we've got a, a bit of a refresh of a webinar that we do uh, every few months when we kind of talk about uh, the state of the world, at least the state of the Android world. And so obviously uh, kind of one of the big new events in the Android world was the release of phones running uh, Android 4.0, which is called Ice Cream Sandwich. And we've got uh, our resident uh, Android expert, Drew Schmanek, here today to uh, talk to us all about uh, Ice Cream Sandwich. So we're going to kind of learn a little bit about um, some of the features that are significant and relevant for IT folks who have to worry about how to secure and manage these devices um, in order to let them be used uh, you know, for corporate use. And uh, Drew's also going to talk a little bit about some of the nice features for um, end users as well. And um, I, I'll just put in my own personal uh, note. I've got a Samsung Galaxy Nexus that I... Um, that I um, bought or I guess got back in uh, early December when Verizon launched it on their uh, 4G network. And uh, I got to admit, it's got a lot of nice improvements from the uh, 2.3 uh, device I came from. So uh, I'm sure Drew's going to see a lot about that. Um, so what um, we're going to do today is here's kind of the format for us. Um, the um, we're going to kind of do our normal thing. We're going to have some slides. Then we're going to do the uh, we're going to do the Q and A uh, afterward. So feel free to uh, shoot your questions to us during the webinar via the chat or Q and A panels. Um, you know, we'll handle them in place if we can where relevant. Otherwise, we'll kind of save them to the end. We're going to do polls uh, like we normally do during uh, the webinar to get your uh, thoughts and feedback, and we'll share the results with you. Um, if you're having trouble hearing for some reason, I think John's already uh, pushed out to everyone uh, dial-in instructions. Um, also, I think John's already pushed out a link to where you can get the slides for today's presentation as well. Uh, and, that, and the recording of the webinar will be at that same spot uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, one, one last thing, um, John's man manning our Maz360 Twitter account right now. And uh, if you uh, are interested, um, he's going to push the hashtag out here in a second uh, and would like to just chat with us uh, through Twitter, use the hashtag John sending out. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Drew. Thanks for joining today, Drew. Thank you, Joe. So I just wanted to touch on, you know, which, which all this excitement and where it's leading to and what's it all about. So here's a Gartner. Uh, just just an image depicting you know the growth uh, in general you know smart firms are smartphones versus PCs right so you'll see here uh, it's pretty pretty in line to escalate as we move forward progressing um, to the years um, you're also going to see another report that uh, Morgan Stanley did as well uh, just just to outline you know the total growth um, from mobile data internet for, um, on mobile devices versus what you're seeing first launched on PCs as well. So you can see a substantial increase um, over the last few years here. So today what you're going to learn, you're actually going to learn some best practices for Android 4.0 or 4.x, um, some new Android uh, 4.0 features from the user interface, and also improvements and security features overall. So basically, to get started, we're going to um, focus on embracing the Android opportunity. So as users are bringing in their own devices into the enterprise, um, what we want to do is have those Android devices um, secure. And Android devices have increased pretty much drastically, the market share since the first launch back in 2008 with the HTC G1 Dream. Um, they pretty much surpassed all the capabilities of the traditional BlackBerry and Windows mobile devices as well. So amazingly enough, uh, the enterprise benefits from this actually, and you ask why, because there's a lot of cost savings associated with this. Uh, from companies, from employee-owned devices with personal voice and data plans, we're seeing in the enterprise they're saving you know, a, a good penny here um, with their users bringing in their own devices. And also, um, so a few studies have shown that employees are working you know, up to 20% more productive 
um, from their night and weekend hours as well, being always connected with their mobile devices. And what, you know, one thing I would add, I mean, obviously one big driver for you know Android adoption, and at least how it relates to security managing devices, is you know employee-owned devices. So people buy Androids for their own personal use, and then you know companies want to figure out how to uh, enable those devices. But um, you know, I, you know, you sh it should be very clear that that Android adoption is not only through that BYOD mechanism. Um, you know, we meet plenty of companies that are buying Android devices, certainly the 4G ones that are now on the market, which are kind of the only ones right now that can leverage 4G networks, um, buying those for their employees to use, you know, both smartphones and tablets, um, and kind of pushing them out as, you know, corporate provision devices. So it's more than just an employee-owned phenomenon. Correct. So um, basically, we need to have a realistic policy in place for the end users, right? So we, we want to, you know, um, support multiple device platforms, but yet allow personal devices, as Joe mentioned also. So you're likely already doing this now, but with very minimal information. Um, the user really can sync Android or even, you know, iOS devices to your Exchange or Domino server without you ever being alerted or notified. Um, that's just, you know, one example of how, how you're up against the wall with, um, reporting on these devices. So cost savings can also add up as well as the employee, you know, is essentially covering their own their, their data plan. Um, so with the inventory tool immediately in place there, um, we, want, we want to be enabled the users and uh, the admins to take stock of the mobile devices. Um, this is going to help understand the risks regarding mobile devices and help you make more informed decisions there. So uh, the solution should also be extended, you know, maybe to your help desk or HR departments as well. So um, this will give you the options to find out supported devices and help in troubleshooting um, how, how your users are able to connect securely and safely to your environment. Um, really, many businesses don't have a good data or have, um, you know, the total amount in their back pocket that they're, you know, connected to corporate resources. So they need to get a, a better understanding of this. And also, you'll see that you'll want to enforce basic security precautions, right? So you'll want to be able to enforce a passcode, enforce remote wipe capabilities, and new with 4.0, you're going to see encryption as a standard. Um, Google is leveraging moving forward to um, complement what is already offered with uh, iOS. So one, one other kind of point here, right, and Drew hit on it. Um, I guess I just wanted to expand on it a little bit. Um, so. You know, we meet companies, you know, every day who uh, have Exchange Active Sync enabled, and um, you know, typically they kind of think they have a pretty good handle on uh, the number of devices that are connected or partnered with mailboxes on the server, and you know, kind of who's partnered, who's got a device. But you know, what we've often found is kind of what people think and what reality is kind of can be quite different. Um, sometimes pretty significantly different, and you know it. It, it certainly is in, in our minds. Um, you know the way. You know the way you begin to bring order to that type of a, of an environment is by getting that inventory established. So you know rather than say, well, I think it's only 20 people that are connected. It you know it's knowing that okay, there's 25 people connected. Here's who they are. Here's what devices they're carrying, and that's what the importance of that inventory information is. So one thing I'll tell you. Um, and I, I, we probably don't have the link handy here, but uh, um, we can probably send it out later. We do offer a free tool on our website uh, called the ActiveSync uh, Reporting Tool that if you're not sure how many mobile devices you've got partnered with your mailboxes, um, you can download this free tool. It, uh, it uh, runs, uh, it's a PowerShell-based tool. Um, install it on uh, a server where you've got your uh, Exchange Admin tools on or, or a workstation where you've got your Exchange Admin tools on, and it'll give you a local readout of how many mobile devices you've got partnered. So, you know, if, if you're sitting there saying, yeah, you know what, I really don't know, well, there, here's a quick, easy way for you to find out. Oh, John beat me to the punch. Thank you, John. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, I know what you're all waiting for is let's dive into what, you know, what's really new with, uh, Android, but we're going to go to poll question one here. So we're going to run our first poll right now, and the question is pretty simple. Do you currently have uh, Android 4X uh, devices connecting to your corporate network? And uh, if not, when do you think you will? And we'll share that with you in a minute. And while we're kind of letting the poll go here, 
Um, one thing I would say to you is um, one thing you should be aware of with 4.0 is that um, is that um, the 3x version of Android was for tablets only. So the last smartphone versions of uh, Android were 2.x versions. I guess 2.3. Yeah, there's um, 2.3. And so, you know, the reality is there's quite a, there was, you know, a whole set of improvements and changes in Android in 3.0 that never made it to the smartphone market. And, you know, let's be honest, Android tablets haven't exactly gotten out there with the, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the uh, wave that, you know, iPad has. So for a lot of people, this is kind of their first exposure to not just 3.0 features, but 4.0 features as well. Okay. So we got our results up here. And... Uh, not surprisingly, uh, lots of folks are already seeing ice cream sandwich. Um, the um, and uh, I guess fundamentally, just about everyone thinks they'll see it within the next six months. So that's good. Uh, that's good information to have. Okay. So moving forward from the poll questions, it's got some good results there. Um, we're going to start off with the new 4.0 user interface, right? So there's a new UI refresh for um, Google and Android 4.0. So basically this shipped first with the Galaxy Nexus on Verizon, was the first US carrier to have it. But you're going to see a new typeface. And the new typeface just embraces these larger 4 inch and above screens. Um, things like Super AMOLED and IPS, LCD. You're going to see a higher resolution and the typeface is optimized for that. Um, we're going to also have virtual menu buttons as well. So um, within the system bar, you're going to see new virtual buttons. So um, along with older devices and some vendors, you know, utilizing capacitive buttons, um, capacitive touch, Android takes us a step further and you can actually, you know, vendors are going to be able to eliminate buttons altogether and just have it incorporated into the framework of Android. Um, we'll see also the system bar is new, so where the, where these, uh, the new virtual buttons are housed, but it actually... Um, gives applications to dim, you know, um, to dim these buttons and enable, you know, uh, advanced views for full screen viewing, right? So the web browser, if you want to, you know, stream a video in the YouTube app or have it uh, full screen present, it can actually dim these buttons and give give the uh, image uh, and display it across the full screen of the device. Um, new with 4.0 natively is resizable widgets. So before with older versions of Android, you know, there were very um, popular launchers such as ADW Launcher or Launcher Pro, but now um, Android incorporates this natively, so you could resize your widgets, and now uh, this will streamline it nice, so if you, you know, shrink it, it'll display or, you know, display more data if you enlarge it as well. Um, so you get this stock now with uh, Android 4.0. And hey, the other nice thing about the, the uh, those uh, buttons at the very bottom, they also orient themselves based on the screen orientation. Yes. So, you know, if you hold the thing kind of lengthwise, the buttons shift over to the right. Yep, they will. Yep, they'll go from portrait or landscape. Absolutely. Um, so, new, some some you know new improvements and features, which we'll get to in a moment. We just want to open up poll question two that we have here for you. So this is kind of a question we've been asking for probably uh, two years now, as long as we've been talking about Android devices. And uh, it's a pretty simple question. So it, it, is fragmentation in the Android ecosystem uh, causing your organization in any way to delay or abandon plans to roll out a corporate-supplied Android device? So we, we know that your employees are going to have them, right? The question is, would that prevent your corporation from using them? It looks like we're uh, getting some results there. So we'll uh, we'll post the uh, poll results right now for everyone. Um, you know this. I, I mean, there's obviously. Uh, I think this problem is, you know, kind of dissipating over time. And I do think um, I do think Google's doing a lot to try to uh, bring more order to the Android ecosystem. I know certainly with the Galaxy Nexus, uh, which is obviously a device manufactured by Samsung, but uses the significant about it is it uses the stock Google version of Android, not a not a version that's kind of been um, you know manipulated or enhanced in any way by the handset manufacturer. It's um, the beginning of kind of I think a more standard um, experience for Android users, and certainly that's good for corporations. So. 
you know, it seems like here, I think you can all see the, res the results here, about 40% are saying that, uh, yeah, it's causing us to kind of sit on our hands as far as adopting them, but uh, certainly uh, a sizable majority feel that it's just fine to adopt these devices, so that's a good thing. Okay. So, m moving on, um, just wanted to take a look at the new improvements and features. Um, with Android 4.0 or above. So I know a lot of people and companies and users in general are just excited. Um, you know, screenshots. Um, we've waited this long and Android users finally <laughs> got it. Um, so um, depending on the, the device variant, um, I, for the Nexus it's volumed, I believe, down in the power button. Yeah. We'll, take, we'll capture a screenshot. So um, as you'll see, different devices may incorporate different mappings for the buttons, but um, it's as nice. It's all. It's here now. We have it with Android 4.0. Yeah. So finally, it, it's caught up to the iPhone there, right? Because it used to be you had to, to use those screenshot captures. Didn't you have to root the device or something? It was. You really, did. It was really yeah. ugly. <laughs> you did have to have system root on all other devices. No more uh, with 4.0. So, um, some along with screenshots, we have actually some advanced copy and paste. So you can now copy and paste blocks of of the messages um, from blocks of tests or texts. And this will just make, you know, copy and pasting maybe um, procedures or any data via email um, uh, for your users a lot lot simpler, a lot more refined. Um, also poses a security risk as well. Um, so you may want to take a look at how you're managing those email accounts on your Android devices as well. Um, so with the improved copy and paste, we have improved text input and spell checking. So there's whole, all new dictionaries now with Android 4.0 to make, you know, the, uh, the spell check more accurate, um, a lot more user friendly, and similar to what you see in iOS, it'll actually underline the word, right, or the misspelled word. So you'll be able to tap it and and apply the uh, the update before you know you really just had a string of you know three or four words depending on what fit in the screen above the keyboard. Now it'll actually find the word and outline it for you in the native in the native app. Um, we do also have some new lock screen actions as well. So along with Android, you know, they paved the way for the ever popular pattern lock. Um, uh, ice cream sandwich actually now implements facial facial recognition. So to unlock the device, so you can use the front facing camera of the device and actually unlock, um, you know, unlock and allow the user to access and enter the device. Now there's an insecurity issue right now with 4.0 where you can use a photo as well of the user's face to, to bypass that. So along, along you know. It being new and, uh, and, and intuitive for the for for the your average hacker, um, I believe I you know believe Google would be working on some um, some workarounds for this. So we we would say right now, if you're you know obviously one of our best practices for corporations for locking down their mobile devices is make sure there's some type of Pin. access control on the device. Um, so this uh, facial recognition is a new type of access control. I, I guess what we would say is stick with you know, pins or uh, swipe if uh, your users prefer that. Right. Um, and we do have some new home screen folders and favorites as well. So similar to iOS, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> you can you can drag and drop, you know, your apps in new, in new folders and, and group them however, you, you know, you're more comfortable with for your experience there. So um, also users can immediately uninstall the apps. Um, by long press, long pressing it, similar to what you can also do with iOS. So it just makes the whole user experience a, a lot, uh, a lot more intuitive for the end user and a lot cleaner. Um, also on the smaller screen devices, um, the home screen in includes you know custom customizable favorites and it makes the tray visible from all your home screens. So yes, with Android you can have multiple home screens, but it will make the favorites visible across all of those there. And I think we're going to uh, we're going to run another poll yep. right now. So, kind of question again is kind of a simple one. Uh, these are the three major uh, Android smartphone manufacturers. Um, we'd be interested in knowing uh, which, if any, or if there's others, um, your company's uh, either deploying or supporting right now. A couple questions have come in. Um, we um, there's a question about um, well, this is actually a comment from one of the uh, one of the uh, attendees. So the the, the uh, 
pointing out that facial unlock doesn't work with encryption enabled. So that's certainly a good thing to know. I suspect that somehow that pin must be part of the encryption key that they use, so that's probably why they require it. Uh, so um, that's good to know, and we would certainly tell you if you've got ice cream sandwich devices that you should enable encryption on the device. So if that means you can't use facial recognition, then so be it. So we've got our um, we've got our poll results up. And uh, you can see it's pretty much what you would think. Everybody's got one of the three big ones, and frankly, there's a pretty significant percentage of people with others. Um, I'm not frankly quite sure who all the others are. I mean, I know Pantex one. Um, I'm not sure who the other major manufacturers would be, but I guess there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. Okay. So um, moving forward, we'll go ahead and we'll go over some security and networking features that you'll have with the refresh and the new implementation of Android 4.0. So we do have network data control, and you'll actually see some screenshots included here. So uh, Android 4.0, it adds new network controls to help manage um, network data usage. So in the settings app, um, you can have a graphical user interface, like a, ni a nice GUI with um, some statistics of how your apps are using mobile data. And also in that second screenshot to the right, you'll see you can actually set up limits. So you can set up, you know, how, how much mobile data you want this particular app to use. Um, so it's real nice. There were third-party apps um, bridging this gap, but now Android um, and Google have incorporated this natively to, to 4.0 um, ice cream sandwich. It's, it's really nice. And so we get, we get asked this a lot, or at least I hear it a lot when I'm talking with customers. They're always looking for ways to either track or limit mobile data usage. And you know, typically they are you know they are interested in that more uh, granular you know what's what are the apps doing, not just tell me about the device as a whole. It's certainly something that we do, and you know it, it's obviously nice to be able to see it this way. But you know, one of the features we offer in Mads 360 is for the administrators to be able to track the devices overall usage uh, across kind of all the devices in their in their that they're managing um, from a single portal. So it's great to be able to have this out on the device, but I don't know uh, in the case of an end user who's really unaware or isn't paying attention that it's going to really do much to help you manage things. Great. Um, also new with network data control, we have the address space layout randomization. So this just helps a lot with storing the app data, which um, it stores it in memory locations. So new with 4.0, it does a better job of mixing this around and they're you know, having some exploits that uh, some hackers have been using to predict the memory locations. With the new randomization uh, for the address spaces, it, 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 it mixes them around and it makes it a little bit more difficult um, for you know for your average average hacktivist there. Uh, so we have some a new email app as well that exp uh, that actually supports Exchange Active Sync version 14 support. So um, it's it's going to be a step forward in allowing cert based authentication, similar to what we have with iOS 5. Um, so you can have your users use uh, potentially a user-based cert. Um, there are you know some some other technicalities in there which you can grab up off Google's developer website also. Um, so pretty much we're looking at steps forward to a, a, an iOS-like look and feel of the email app. Um, there is some new VPN client integration, so there's a new API out there. So developers actually. Uh, it's a library. They're going to be able to take advantage of this newer API and enforce the access of L2TP and IPsec protocols. So um, you, saw, you saw the VPN options there for uh, 2.x devices, but really um, weren't, weren't uh, the easiest devices to get a tunnel set up with and connecting in. So Android 4.0 looks to, to bridge the gap there. So a question came in. You, I think you answered it, but just maybe worth repeating. What, what, I, what VPN protocols are supported? Um, with 4.0, the new one is L2, the new two are L2TP and IPsec protocols. So it's kind of virtually every right. concentrator with some right. things. And depending on the, the, that's the library that they have new for the developers, but depending on you know how how those um, vendors are going to take advantage of the API, you'll be able to tie uh, the profiles in the framework of Android to to connect successfully this time. Um, new, we have actually everyone. From, from the admin side of things is on device encryption. So we have full device encryption now for Android 4.0 or above. This is new to the phones, period. Outside of the Motorola EDMI or the EDM APIs. So Motorola had a spe 
special baked ROMs for their, you know, their droids and things, things of that nature that allow them to take, um, you know, file level encryption, you know, to the forefront and allow your users to, you know, potentially have their SD cards encrypted. Well, now, um, 4.0 it, it initializes encryption on mobile phones. It's something that we only had on 3.0. Now we have it on mobile phones, and what we'll actually will be the standard with um, Google's platform of Android moving forward. Now, my understanding is it's software-based encryption, right, not hardware-based? Right, yes. All right, so that's one kind of difference. I think Motorola's is hardware-based. Um, um, Motorola's file, file level, it's, it's ROM-dependent. Okay. So if you were to, you know, flash a new ROM, unroot your device and flash a new ROM on Motorola, you may lose that, that, that library being tied into that, that ROM. So it, it's only set to those Motorola devices. Right. And is the um, is the encryption support cover the SD card as well? Yeah, the, the encryption support will be on device encryption, so okay. you can you so can it's full device. Mm -hmm. Okay, full right. device encryption for ICS. Yes. Okay. So, um, just just wanted to wrap up. Well, we're going to do one more poll question. Okay. Right? So um, this is kind of a question. It actually came in during the webinar here. Um, so what we're going to ask is, what email clients are you using on Android devices in your organization? So um, we've got some of the more popular ones up here. Um, this question kind of came in during the during the webinar about the touchdown client. Now the reality is you don't need to use the touchdown client on Android devices. The native email client um, that ships with them supports Active Sync, uh, you know, going back to forever, I guess. Two dot two. And um, and so, uh, you know, any Android device 2.2 and above could connect to an Exchange server or a Notes Traveler server and sync email contact calendars. Um, problem with it is it's a bit of a um, disconnected experience. So each app is separate. There's a separate calendar app, a separate people app for contacts, and a separate mail app uh, for sending and receiving email. And so, you know, you as the end user have to kind of jump between all three. So it wasn't kind of an integrated experience like people were used to coming out of a BlackBerry environment, right, where all of those features were integrated together. So, you know, Touchdown's one that tried to pr provide that kind of capability uh, in the Android world, um, which is why it's uh, very popular. But beyond that, they've also extended it and added a lot of additional security features, um, like, for example, encrypting the email itself, blocking the forwarding of attachments, the uh, saving of attachments, and also kind of being able to enable that a PIN be required before you can access the email app. So, you know, if you're at, I don't know, you're at dinner with your kids and you unlock your phone so they can play a game, they couldn't hit your mail app and just get into your email. There'd be, prompt, there'd be a prompt for a PIN. So they had some nice features, and that's kind of why companies have kind of adopted that. So here's the... Uh, Kind of results. So obviously, most people are preferring the native email client. And I think, frankly, this is a pretty big difference from the last time we did this poll. I remember the touchdown stuff kind of being adopted much more. So it looks like, you know, people maybe are getting more comfortable with the native client. It's certainly getting more capable over time. That's an interesting feedback there. Yeah, we're also seeing the trend for Google to, you know, trying to enforce the uniformity um, from the fragmentation of it. So. Um, from HTC putting sense and wrapping it in email, you're seeing more versions of devices being shipped with a vanilla experience also. So, okay. right. So a uh, quick kind of here comes the quick commercial here, and then we'll jump to uh, we'll jump into uh, the Q and A. Um, obviously, uh, our product Maz 360. Uh, is a mobile device management platform for managing kind of all mobile devices that your mobile users may be carrying. So that would include uh, iOS devices from Apple, Android devices from a variety of manufacturers, as well as kind of legacy devices, Symbian, uh, Palm, WebOS. Uh, we also support Windows 7, Windows Phone 7.5 and BlackBerry. Um, so, you know, what we try to do is provide total enterprise device management. So being able to manage the mobile device, um, the user of that device, uh, the apps and content the device uh, has uh, stored on it, as well as its access to corporate networks and other corporate infrastructure. We do all that in a 100% cloud-based model uh, that uh, lets you very quickly um, 
you know, deploy MAS uh, and get devices enrolled so we can get uh, folks up and running in an MDM, in an MDM solution in about 10 minutes. It's literally that quick, and uh, you can try it uh, for free. We offer a 30-day eval as well. So uh, if you're interested and you're trying to learn more about uh, MDM um, or you'd like to find out more about MAS 360, uh, feel free to try it. We definitely support Android 4.0 devices because mine's in there, so I know that <laughs> for a fact. Uh, and, um, you know, we'd uh, certainly encourage you to give it a try. And I think at the end of the webinar, uh, your browser is going to get redirected to a link that will uh, let you click through and, and sign up for an eval if you want to take it. So, um, end of commercial. Um, this slide I'm just going to kind of, uh, kind of walk through really quickly. So, there's a lot of different um, you know, features and functions that are available depending on the platform. I'm not going to bore you all with the details. If you want to see all these things in action, we'd be happy to demo it for you or you can sign up for a free trial. Um, last thing, um, Network World did an eval of uh, MDM products, uh, I guess, summer of last year. And uh, you can see they kind of, you know, looked at kind of all the leading platforms. Uh, we were certainly happy that they thought our uh, platform, MAS360, was uh, the best based on how easy we were to deploy and use, uh, which uh, we think is just a huge advantage in kind of this mobile world. So, you know, again, um, if you've got the opportunity and the interest, please give it a shot. Um, one last thing, and then we'll jump over to Q&A. Uh, we said it before, but, you know, you can certainly uh, go to the MAS360, the hashtag here, and give us your thoughts, more questions if you want, comments. We're certainly happy to get your feedback. Uh, follow us on Twitter. You see our, uh, our uh, handle there. So, you know, please feel free to, uh, you know, communicate with us that way. And in wrapping up, before we jump into the Q&A, um, the next webinar in two weeks, on March 1st, is going to be the best practices for building and testing mobile applications. And uh, I think we're pushing out a link if you're interested in registering. Frank Schlondorn, who's our director of QA, is going to be our guest for that. So obviously Frank's done lots of testing of mobile apps, right? So uh, if you're interested, if you're building mobile apps and you're wondering about what tools, techniques, uh, tricks there are to uh, test these either more effectively or more efficiently. Um, please, uh, you know, uh, sign up for that webinar and ask Frank lots of questions. He loves questions, uh, so uh, I'm sure you'll learn a lot. We did a we did a webinar two weeks ago on building apps for iPhones and iPads, and uh, you know, got a lot of uh, a lot of great feedback, and that was why we thought we'd follow it up with a app centered around testing, because obviously you got to do more than just write the code, you got to test it as well. So Frank can give you a lot of good feedback on that. Um, obviously all of our webinars are recorded and available in the Master Center. I think John's been pushing the links out during, uh, during the event. Um, you'll also find tons of other good content at the Master Center. Um, you know, if, you've, if you're using MAS360 or evaling MAS360 and you've got questions, uh, you know, obviously you can post them there, and, you know, there's a number of people here at Fiberlink that are, you know, in those forums and getting back to people through the Master Center. Uh, but you also find just lots of good content about MDM in general, so it's not all about uh, our product. Uh, it's really a place where anybody can go and learn about mobility. So uh, we'd certainly encourage you to come visit. Um, lots of people have. Um, so I'm going to kind of stop talking now, and I'm going to kind of scroll through our chat and Q&A uh, panels. And um, Drew and I are going to do our best here, I think, to, uh, to take on some of, your, some of your questions. So question about any update on ice cream sandwich for the Nexus S. So... There's not a lot we can say about when the, uh, you know, when the different handset manufacturers, and I think in some cases the carrier actually controls when these updates go out. So, I mean, I know I carried around a, uh, both the Samsung Galaxy S and an HTC and, you know, was kind of always wishing, you know, because I was always behind a couple versions of Android that, that they could get out. So it's, a store, it's definitely a, a sore point for uh, all of us Android users that there's newer things available, but we can't get them. 
but that's kind of where the world is right now. I'm sure that'll get better over time, you know, and I think that's the whole point of this, you know, Nexus branding that Google's doing with the handset manufacturers, right, is to kind of at least ensure that those Nexus branded devices are on a common, you know, unified version of Android and, you know, will be updated in a kind of a uniform way. So I think that's a, a big benefit. So, so it's kind of a comment about uh, Jelly Bean 5.0 coming out in the near future. Sure, I mean, there's always going to be uh, fragmentation. Um, lots of questions here. Uh, question is, can you force a combination of facial recognition with a pin? That would be like a two-factor kind of thing. Uh, okay, so the, the, uh, the answer we're getting here from the panel is if the facial recognition fails, yes. it will fall back to asking the user for the pin. But there is no way to set both up. Uh, another question, are any MDM vendors using the APIs and ice cream sandwich to control things like mobile data limits to remotely administer? So, so we do our own uh, managing and monitoring of mobile data usage, so that's the answer for us. Uh, obviously, if the uh, platform provides better hooks to do those things, uh, we'll be hooking into those via our client. So, um, you know, yeah, our, certainly our... Uh, our, our position would be if the operating system provides a better mechanism to do things, then we would do it. Does the new email app on Android 4 support EAS policies? Um, I believe it does, um, yep. because I know when I synced mine up to our corporate email, I suddenly was forced to enter a PIN to get the device, to get access to the device. Ah, okay, so another yeah. interesting feature here. If policies get pushed down from your Exchange server, um, facial res recognition gets disabled. So it seems like kind of everybody's kind of saying if the corporation's going to going to manage this thing in any way, shape, or form, then facial recognition really needs to be disabled. That's correct. Um, can you set up and enforce setting the VPN to always connect and route traffic through a web content filtering product like WebSense or Zscaler? So uh, I get asked this question 10 times a day. Uh, everybody's looking for content filtering uh, for their mobile devices like they're used to getting for their uh, laptops, right? Um, so the, the real answer here is there is not a good way today to force a VPN tunnel. So um, I, we've been doing a little bit of work with Zscaler on like VPN on demand in the iOS world to try to approximate some of that. Um, here's kind of the, the best suggestions I can give you. I know of no way today to force a VPN tunnel all the time uh, on an Android device. Uh, obviously, there's things like Cloud ACL out there, which are like safe browsers, which will uh, replace the, uh, well, they won't replace, they'll, 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 uh, they can be installed and used instead of the stock Android browser, and they will provide some level of content filtering and let you configure, you know, blacklists and whitelists of websites. Um, if you use something like that in with Maz360, some of the things we can do to help there is we can disable the Android browser. So you can basically force people to use the safe browser if they uh, if they're going to browse the web. Um, only only thing we don't have today that would help you there would be that ability to configure those uh, blacklist website blacklists and whitelists. Those things still have to be done kind of locally on the device via web ACL or uh, cloud ACL, I think is the product. So, you know, the short answer, or long answer, I guess now, is it's not perfect yet. Uh, obviously, the market's clamoring for it because, like I said, I hear this many, many times a day. So uh, I'm sure that uh, people are busily working on a solution to it. Is it possible to go through a proxy while using Wi-Fi using an Android device? We filter our internet content. So this is kind of the other way to do it, which is proxy all your internet traffic someplace where there's a, there's a security appliance. Um, so I, don't, I think the answer today is you can do this pretty well on iOS, but you can't on Android. Some specific vendors have implemented proxy support. Um, Google had very limited support. 
but it's not uh, fully baked in yet to the OS. Okay. So, and they have to be manually configured. There's no way to access it by APIs, unfortunately, at this time. So, a question about uh, MAS360. Does MAS360 allow uh, for mail, contacts, and calendar sync directly to the new app, email app in uh, ICS4? So, one thing that's kind of important to know about MAS360 is this. So we, we don't at all get into the flow of synchronizing contacts, calendars, um, or email, right? So uh, there's something called ActiveSync that Microsoft invented a long time ago that uh, is pretty much adopted universally now that does a really good job of doing those things. And so we didn't really think we could uh, add much to that. And so uh, MAS360 does not... Uh, get involved at all in the synchronization of email or contacts or calendars. Now, the reality is we think that provides a couple of significant benefits um, over, you know, uh, other products in the marketplace that rely on uh, either having appliances or networks that your company's confidential information flows through um, or specialized email clients that sit out on the mobile device. Uh, and kind of here's what we believe. One, people bought iPhones, iPads, Androids because they like that iPhone, iPad, Android experience. And, you know, putting kind of custom apps on, um, commercial apps on to replace those features and functions uh, isn't always, uh, doesn't always go down well with the end users. So while you may get some security features uh, that you might not get uh, in, the, in the kind of things that ship by default with the devices, Certainly the experience is altered, and the end users are typically much more glued to the experience than anything else, right? Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing that we like about our particular architecture, meaning we're not in the middle of any of that data flow, is that we can, uh, you know, there is none of your confidential information that ever goes through MAS360. The only thing MAS360 is doing is um, pulling some inventory information off the device and storing it for your IT folks to view and sending MDM commands down to the devices, either through the push networks for those platforms or through your uh, Exchange ActiveSync infrastructure. Um, so it's a very lightweight, very light touch system. And the third benefit in our minds is that outages that you will typically see in, in the stacks of companies that do it the other way, I don't want to say the three letter acronym, um, can't occur with MAS360. So, you know, MAS360 could never cause your end users to not be able to send or receive email, not uh, browse the Internet, not send uh, chat texts and anything else. So we think that's a huge advantage for our solution. So, you know, we can never, ever uh, uh, do anything that would make your end users unproductive. So that was a good question. So Old Honeycomb had WPA2 Leap, but Ice Cream Sandwich does not. Will it be in the future enhancement? Uh, Leap is generally considered a, 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 a dead protocol because of its security holes and whatever. It was replaced by EFAT quite a few years ago at this point. Um, I'm actually was unaware it was removed until I just heard that. I'm not surprised it was removed. It's been rumored to be removed from multiple uh, sub Wi-Fi supplicants for a while now. I wouldn't count on it. If it's not there now, I doubt they will add it back in. Um, they probably removed it because of the fact that it's not very widely implemented anymore. Okay. Leap was an early, early Cisco uh, protocol used for wireless 802.11 X authentication, 802.1 X authentication. Uh, another question came in, does MAS allow for remote Wi-Fi configuration? Uh, remote just, Wi-Fi configuration. Pushing the Wi-Fi profile. Yes, we do allow for pushing corporate Wi-Fi profile down to the device through uh, our application. Yes, you can create one or more bookmarks from within the policies, and they will be automatically created on the users. And those uh, bookmarks can be added or deleted based on policy enforcement actions that you set up. All right. So that would include 802.11x profile. Yes, you can push 802.11x profile down. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Which we would say is, would be a best practice for corporate <laughs> WLAN. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, question is, if Ice Cream Sandwich supports encryption, does a device have to be wiped when upgrading from Gingerbread to have data encrypted on ICS? It's a good question. No. Uh, so, no, you should not need to. Once you do the upgrade, you can start the encryption after the upgrade begins. You do need to wipe the device to remove encryption. The 
standard Android encryption mechanism requires that once it's encrypted, it can only be unencrypted by initiating a wipe on the device. With that said, there are vendors who have previously implemented their own encryption formats within devices, such as Motorola. I believe HTC may have. So there are vendors who in earlier 2.x devices did have encryption capabilities that worked differently. Motorola, for example, allowed you to encrypt at both the device level as well as the application level, and you can encrypt and decrypt to your heart's content without wiping. Whether those vendors, when they start implementing Ice Cream Sandwich, will adopt the standard Google encryption mechanism or whether they will continue to use their own encryption methods is yet to be seen. Again, as you mentioned, there's really not many 4.0 devices out right now where we can make good comparisons outside of Google and a few tablet vendors who jumped on board early adopting the Google standard OS. Okay. So there's a question about does Android 4 qualify for FIPS? So I guess the answer is, is that encryption algorithm FIPS 140, you know, kind of certified? I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. So that's something we'd have to research and get back to you on. I know that's important in uh, government circles. Um, so I'm really kind of... There's a lot of questions here kind of related to uh, MAS functionality. Can MAS360 push an app and install the app on the Android device without user involvement? Thanks. So the reality is I don't think anyone can get an app installed without user involvement. So, um, you know, there is no way, frankly, on, I think Apple's got a couple things you can now do, right, to force, to, to kind of initiate the install without the end user actually clicking on something. But again, this is just more of, you know, where these devices have come from, right? They were built, you know, their roots are in the consumer market. Um, that's obviously where they're getting their, they're making their money and traction, both companies. And so they're certainly going to cater to that market for now. Uh, obviously, the, you know, all of us who are in the IT business and certainly the security part of the IT business, you know, always want to be able to lock things down as tightly as possible. Well, the reality is that, you know, these devices as of today just can't be locked down the way a BlackBerry could be locked down or the way you might have been able to, you can lock down a Windows laptop, right? So it's it's really more a matter of understanding what you can do and can't do and being able to compensate for it. So, um, you know, the way, the way MAS360 handles those types of situations is this. Um, there's a lot of things that you can't force to happen on a device. But what you can do is you can know what state you want the device to be in, right? Is an app installed or not installed? Uh, is an app that shouldn't have been installed, installed? And what we do in our strategy is not so much to prevent users from doing things they can or can't do because you can't prevent that. It's more to monitor for when those things occur and then put the device in a non-compliant state. And then uh, at that point, it's kind of in a penalty box uh, you get to decide in MAS what you want the penalty box to be, right? So it can be a very strict penalty box, like I'm going to wipe your device. It could be a very uh, non-strict one, like I'm going to send you a notification saying, hey, why did you do this? You're out of compliance. Um, but the basic uh, strategy is if somebody does something that puts a device in a non-compliant state, they're put in the penalty box, you get to define what the penalty box means, and they stay in the penalty box until the device is back in compliance. So that's the basic strategy that I think everyone uses across the board in the industry for managing mobile devices. And it's precisely because you cannot lock the devices down and you cannot lock the users down uh, as well. So another question about encrypting email. So an ice cream sandwich, yes, the if you want to specifically, you know, have uh, encryption off on the device, but you want email encrypted, then yeah, you would need a third-party email client to do that. Obviously, there's a number of them out there. Um, you know, there's Touchdown, which is a company we work with. Um, what's nice about Touchdown is it uses Exchange Active Sync underneath as the transport, so uh, you don't have to, you know, worry about your email going through third-party. Uh, you know, servers and third-party networks, your, your, your email's not reliant on their availability or their stability, so, you know, we think that's a little bit better answer. Um, but there's a number of them available. So 
There's a question about support for Juno's Pulse. I guess we see this one all the time. Uh, I honestly, I would have, well, I think Juno's Pulse supports uh, sure. IPsec, right? Uh, there's a Juno's Pulse client for Android. I don't believe it's supporting IPsec okay. yet. And as of last check with them, because we do check with them periodically, there still was no update on when they were going to be supporting it. Um, for iOS, yes. Yeah. So as a question about can Maz push Wi-Fi settings down to employee phones, absolutely. So we think that's kind of a huge benefit for um, your support, your IT team, and your help desk. So we can push two profiles down. We can push the profile down to allow the device to get on your corporate network, um, your corporate Wi-Fi WLAN. Uh, so that's nice because when they walk into the office, the thing will connect, and if people are using it in the office, that traffic goes over your Wi-Fi network, not over your cellular, uh, uh, not over the cellular network. So it helps you a little bit on cost control. Um, the other advantage is obviously, it's, uh, if you're using 802.11, it's extremely or 802.1x, it's extremely secure. Um, the other thing we can push down is your um, Exchange Active Sync email profile to your end users. So, you know, that's another, you know, nice feature because historically, you know, you kind of can give the end users the instructions for how to do all this stuff, but, you know, it's hard to do, and, I mean, I've screwed it up plenty of times, and I'm a technologist, so I'm sure end users uh, that aren't armed with all that knowledge uh, probably have even more trouble than I do, and, of course, that results in a call to your help desk. So. Uh, we think these are kind of great benefits uh, from a productivity perspective. Your end users are productive right away. Your help desk's not bothered with a phone call, and you don't have to tell anybody how to do it so that they can't tell 10 more people how to do it. We also just uh, elevated our 3.0 version of our Android agents in the marketplace last week, which added the ability to push bookmarks down, Okay. web bookmarks. So it's a feature that was available on iOS and we have available on Android. Nice. And take websites and push them down to users and yep. give the link. I think we just covered a few of these. Mm -hmm. um, question about PKI certs. Can Maz help in distributing uh, PKI certs out? Not to Android devices yeah. currently. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. yet. Um, so iOS, obviously, this is all built in natively to the platform, so that supports it there in Maz. Uh, it's a, still a work in pro progress with Android. And, you know, this is part of what makes, you know, MDM a bit of a challenge, right, because the capabilities are very kind of uneven. Um, you know, iOS has its own set of kind of capabilities. Android's got a set, and then within Android, there's a number of variants that have, you know, even kind of more, you know, kind of difference, differences. So it is a bit of a challenge to keep up with. Um, so here's a good question. Can, uh, if a user roots or jailbreaks a device, can Maz still protect them or control the devices? So I, I'm not sure. even going to, this one's a, a softball for us, so I'm not <laughs> even going to answer this one. I'll let one of you guys take it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for Android and iOS, we can report and detect uh, for, you know, device root or jailbreak. And that doesn't limit us from being able to control or, you know, send actions down to the device or manage policies on the device. Um, it is giving your admins a heads up on, these devices that are potentially at risk on the network, um, but yes, we can we can certainly still manage rooted and jailbroken devices. So one of the one of the kind of key components of the uh, Maz 360 uh, service is our compliance engine, and one of the things you can have our compliance engine be checking for you is uh, to check all of your mobile devices uh, for any that have been uh, rooted or jailbroken. And so what you can, the way to think of the compliance engine is it's like an IT guy that's kind of awake 24-7 watching the state of all your mobile devices. One of the things we can look for is whether a device has been jailbroken or rooted. And one of the things you can do is you can say that you can configure a, the, a rule in our compliance engine to say, hey, Maz, if you detect a device is rooted or jailbroken, could you please take this action on my behalf? And uh, that action could be something as simple as, hey, we're going to alert people via email about what's happened. It could be as drastic as I'm going to wipe the device right away. And you've got complete control over that. So that's kind of nice if, uh, you know, uh, somebody's got uh, too much time on their hands uh, on a, late on a Saturday night and they decide to jailbreak their iPhone, uh, you don't have to worry about getting up to deal with it. Maz will do that for you.
can apps be uninstalled on Android?